This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. What's up, Detroit sports fans? Welcome to the Phantom Show, made by fans, for fans, powered by the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I'm Nick, and with me is Anderson to give us this week's topics. Well, the Pistons have had a pretty bipolar week of basketball, and the Lions have they basically stayed in one pole. We'll talk about them both. It's a fan report. Andrew, what is one thing that the Lions and the Pistons have in common over the last week? They've lost a game. Wrong, actually. Because one of these teams did oh, wait, not oh, yeah. lose a game. Yeah. It feels like we did, but you yeah. know. <laughs> I was the answer is both of them didn't lose all their games. There you go. <laughs> so how about some optimism positivity in this time? <laughs> Put in the right direction. Uh, I mean, that was probably let's be honest, with the Lions, that was probably the worst looking tie I've ever seen. Both teams in my deserve life. an L in their record. Yes. For that performance. Like it no was, team should get the tie. No. You should get it, both get a loss. Yes, it was absolutely abysmal. Like it it was disgustingly bad. Uh Jared Goff with a real big hot 1.8 yards per attempt. Just I, just like, uh, think about it for a second. That's five feet. Just, like I legit had a, a yards per attempt average of five feet. <laughs> I legit I can I can I cannot think of the last time I've seen a game where I would legitimately give both teams an F for their performance. I mean, okay. No, no, F. The Lions defense F. doesn't deserve an F. F. I would give the Lions defense like a C minus. I'm not giving you credit for being able to stop Mason Rudolph. You stopped Najee Harris. You did not stop Najee Harris. He they didn't get in the end refu- zone. They refused to give him the ball. He didn't get. In, uh, he had the ball he, like twenty times. He did get. He did get in the end. Zone. They refused to give a ball towards the end zone. I mean, and they he did get in the end zone once, and then they called it back on a bogus holding penalty. Okay, so, <laughs> he didn't score on you though. Like, I give a C minus. They would they would drive to the five yard line, first and goal, and then never give the ball to Najee. So we just keep passing Mason Rudolph and just sailing it. Well, like that's every, Mike Tomlin's problem. That's not so, the Lions yeah, I'm defense's sorry. problem. I'm you sorry. I can't give dealt. the Lions defense to. You play for stopping the Najee Harris. I can't. You can't fault them for being able to stop what the Steelers were doing. I know. I'm saying I can't say that they stopped Najee Harris. I can't legitimately come on. I can. They stopped, him getting, they stopped him from scoring. Just, I can sit here and say that man, they stopped. They they caused the Pittsburgh Steelers to put up only 16 points. All I'm saying is Najee still rushed for 100 yards. Okay. He like, touched the ball it, like 25 it, times. Anybody should be able to rush yeah, for a hundred yards. Four yards to carry. What? Four yards to carry. That's four yards. That's below carry. average That's in the NFL. That is, is considered below average in the NFL. He had twenty six carries for one hundred five yards, four yards per carry. But the average yard per carry for a bell cow back is about four point three, four point four. Mm-hmm. They held him to a below average day. Above average for him because he's been very inefficient on the ground. But <laughs> I give Lions defense C minus. Okay. There are some playmakers in that Steelers offense, Najee Harris being one of them. They kept them quiet. Yeah, I bet I bet Najee scored two. I bet Najee scored two touchdowns in this game. And, well, that um, was dumb, wasn't it? Hindsight. It wasn't. <laughs> if you look at the Eagles game, it was it felt like a very good bet. Um, but Mike Tomlin again refused to give Najee the ball towards the goal line. So felt like you didn't have to. Felt like oh. taking a look at the other options. You also so got to remember the Lions. Clearly probably, you did. They didn't win a game against an 0-8 football team. So well, I mean, the Lions <laughs> give the Lions defensive play calling a little bit of credit. They zeroed in on the guy they figured would get the ball. And Mike Tomlin knew that they they called what the Steelers were trying to do near the goal line and said, we'll make you beat us doing something else. And well, the Steelers proved they couldn't because it ended in a tie and a brutal, disgusting Worst that, display of football I've ever seen. Die. <laughs> I do think you're oversimplifying because the one time he did give him, he got in the end zone. It got called back, and they never went back to it. Like, <laughs> regardless, don't hold. But, <laughs> don't get called for holding. Don't put yourself in a situation. There's plenty of opportunities that Najee Harris could have gotten the ball and gotten in the end zone. They they gave Najee Harris could have broken a 40 yard run. They stopped him. 20 yard run. They stopped him. Like they there there were plenty of opportunities. Najee Harris touched the ball over. What did he have? Four catches also? Yes. Najee Harris touched football 30 times in this game. That was 30 opportunities for him to get in the end zone. He didn't. 
So we're giving credit for them for him stopping him getting the end zone from fifty yards out. Not every single ball, not every single <laughs> carry he had was outside of the outside of the twenty. I can promise you that. The vast. He okay, maybe had okay, and in all reality, a vast majority of every running back's carries are outside the twenty. Let's I know, be real. But I'm talking specifically about carries in the red zone. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Regardless, the Lions' defense <laughs> deserves some credit in this game. They held the Steelers' offense to 16 points with or without Ben Roethlisberger. That is tough to do in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Holding an NFL offense to 16 points in today's game, today's rules, today's whatever, with that defensive talent, that's a feat in my mind. They deserve some credit. I think it's the first time I've ever been more positive on the lines than I am. Oh, I'm not positive on them. They suck. <laughs> like, they, they are absolutely abysmal. How about, the offensive, how about the offensive play calling? We finally saw Swift get fed. I don't quite know why Goff was out there, but we finally saw Swift get fed. Dan Campbell was in charge of the play calling this week. You saw a very different yes, look to was. the offense. Uh, yes, DeAndre Swift got fed. I do think that was out of more necessity than anything. It just so happened I'd, to work out for them. Uh, I'll agree with you. Uh, and by necessity, I mean you not only had an injured quarterback, but it was also really, really awful weather. So mm-hmm. it was going to be a ground and pound type game no matter what. And mm-hmm. then you add in the fact that, yes, the quarterback was hurt and couldn't throw the ball six feet. So you ended up with a ground and pound attack with a lot of running backs, actually. I mean, I- Iguabuike was really good. Mm-hmm. He he showed a lot of potential in this game as well. Uh, he didn't touch the ball a ton, but in his two carries, I mean, dude averaged 28 yards per carry. He had a 42-yard run. Yeah, I know. And he got into the end zone. Mm-hmm. Jamar Jefferson also looked good in his in his limited work as well. 41 yards and three mm-hmm. carries. And Swift obviously looked good. He wasn't very efficient, but he touched the ball a lot. It's a, it's hard to be efficient carrying the ball 33 times. You're gonna you're gonna regress back to the unless your name point. is Derrick Henry. Unless your name is Derrick Henry. <laughs> 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 but um, no, they brought up a very good point on uh on local on 97.1 about about Dan Campbell's basic decision making in this game and like should golf you be in this game like it's it's almost damned if you damn if you do damn if you don't situation like either golf was not capable of playing football on Sunday and you left him in the game and just decided to run the ball or golf was cable and you refused to let him throw the ball either way it's not a good look like you should never like I agree that we should never be trotting out a quarterback that we can't trust to throw the football. Like if it's, if you're, if you've, if you've lost your trust in golf that much, or if he's that hurt where you have to protect them that severely, you got to put someone else in. I mean, I don't think that's, I feel like that's pretty logical. (laughs) I mean, he really should not have been out there to begin with. Yeah. So I'm saying like it, it, you had a strained oblique. I get, trotting him out there during warm up seeing how he's doing but yeah. if it's obvious that he's not 100% or even 80% and it was very obvious that he wasn't he shouldn't be in there you know it's it's not like we're talking about Aaron Rodgers or Peyton Manning or whoever here that's a superstar you know those guys are they have the the forte and the pedigree to go to essentially dictate whether or not they can go themselves Mm-hmm. Jared Goff does not have that pedigree. He does not have that prowess in this league. He's not good enough. So if Jared Goff is only going to be 60%, don't put him out there. Don't put him in the lineup. I don't care who your backup is, even if it was David Blau that day, because Tim Boyle still not back. He at least has got to be able to throw the ball a little bit better than Jared Goff was in this game. And, mm-hmm. and it's not like the line wasn't protecting him either, and because if, the line played yeah. fairly well yeah. in this game. And if he isn't capable, then why is he on your team? Like it's it it begs a lot of questions, if you ask me. I mean, absolutely. Like it it and I don't know what reason the Lions have for playing Jared Goff in this game over David Blau or whoever. Or, but frankly, I don't care what the reasoning was going in, but by halftime when the guy only had eleven yards, <laughs> that's kind of time to make a switch, no? Yeah. No, I one hundred percent agree. And now it comes out that, well, Jared Goff may be too banged up to play this weekend. So what what took so long? Watch us get a win. Well, gee, (laughs) 
Maybe. I mean, it's, it's really like Dan Campbell sitting in his office after this game going, well, damn, maybe I should have played David Blau. Like, really? <laughs> Jesus, man. I mean, Sunday was so painful, dude. Like, it really felt like I was watching two amateur football teams. And neither of these amateur football teams seem to have any interest in winning the football game. Like we could have, I feel like we could have gone two more overtimes and it still would have been in the tie. No, clearly <laughs> agree. it looked like neither one, neither team wanted to win. Neither team was going to force the issue to win. I mean, the lions had an opportunity a couple of times to win this game. They missed an extra point in regulation. They, I believe missed yeah. an, uh, a field goal in regulation. Maybe not, but they, no, they missed an extra point in regulation. The field goal was an was overtime, overtime, which okay. what the hell was that kick also? Yeah, that was <laughs> ugly. And now that dude's looking for a job. He's probably going to be bagging groceries by the end of the week. Wait, did they cut him? Uh, I believe so, because they brought in a new kicker from the Patriots practice squad today and officially signed him. Yep, they released him. Yep. Yeah. Wouldn't you? Because mm-hmm. that was abysmal. Like, yeah. They added two kickers. Not surprised. They'll figure it out throughout the week, cut one of them, keep the other. Riley Patterson from the New England practice squad and Aldrich Rosas. Really? Mm-hmm. That's a name who actually has kicked in this league. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. We'll see how they that also works waived out. Geronimo Allison, which I could swear they did weeks ago. But I could have sworn that happened weeks ago also. Unless they probably picked him back up and then waved him again. Maybe. The Lions did add a speaking of Geronimo Allison, uh or wide receivers, I should say. They I should mm-hmm. say they did add a wide receiver to that room this week, uh Josh Reynolds is now yep. a Detroit Lion, and he, Dan Campbell is saying that he will be ready to go this weekend. And or does that help this Lions receiving core at all? I mean, he's immediately the best receiver we have, if you ask me. But uh, That ain't saying much. I, I know. And he was, what, the third best receiver for in, uh, in the Rams last year? So, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think he's immediately the best receiver, but it doesn't help your receiving core if no one can give him the football. So, I yes. And on paper, it helps your receiving core. But am I expecting the Lions to be a better passing offense? Not really, because I don't trust anyone. I don't think Josh Reynolds. I don't think Josh Reynolds makes you that much better. Yeah. Uh, it, in all reality, he's just a body, mm-hmm. and they need bodies at that position right now because of injury. Mm-hmm. Whatever they need bodies there, and and yeah. he's going to be one. He's going to get an opportunity to. Earn a contract somewhere else next year. Uh, are you at all concerned about the fact that uh, TJ Hawkinson? I was just about to ask that only, same exact question. What only targeted once, nothing came out of it. I'm more concerned about the fact that this is becoming a theme with TJ Hawkinson. Mm-hmm. My my question is becoming: Is this guy actually a Pro Bowl caliber tight end? Or did Matthew Stafford make him a Pro Bowl caliber tight end? Yeah, because like on a on a day like on a day like Sunday, yeah, the, the the golf was abysmal, but you would expect at the very least, with the way things were going, the check down to TJ, the short pass to TJ Hawkinson, the check down to DeAndre Swift would be there. DeAndre Swift was tied for the most targets in the team. Hawk only had one, so I don't know. I mean, the disconnect is it there. could be as simple as defenses are just keying into TJ Hawkinson and they will not let him beat them, which mm-hmm. is very possible and honestly pretty likely. But at the same time, the good tight ends in this league still find ways to be active in the offense. And the other aspect is TJ Hawkinson's blocking ability hasn't really even been very good at all. Like he's been a poor, a, a minus blocker this year to yeah. this point. And so really, he's not providing much for this Lions offense at all right now. And and that's kind of becoming a big problem and a little bit of a worry for me because it, mm-hmm. it has become a theme this year. He's had maybe one or two solid games and the rest have been total duds. And this is a year that I would that I going into. We said TJ Hawkinson's going to be the number one weapon on this offense. He's the focal point of this passing game. And yeah, there are all those reports out of trading camp that right. he has a really good connection with Jared Goff. Exactly, and we've seen nothing of the sort. Like, we've seen mm-hmm. the exact opposite that really, you know, is it more Jared Goff can't find him or is it TJ Hawkinson just can't find a way to get open? Mm-hmm. And it's very possible it could be both. 
Because it's not like I'm sitting here saying, oh, TJ Hawkinson's getting open a lot. Why not? Why aren't we throwing the ball to him? He's mm-hmm. not. Yeah. But I'll be honest. I have no interest in seeing Jared Goff taking our snap for his football team. <laughs> like, Well, get used to it. We got a whole other year and a half, bud. It's so painful to watch. We got a year and a half of this left. I would rather hold have this be like a, a pseudo open audition scenario where we sign a new quarterback every week. It's like, Ooh, let's see what this guy can do. That'd be fun. <laughs> That'd be fun. I just At least to be more entertaining. <laughs> but, um, all right, next week we are 10 point dogs to the Browns. Who you taking? Give me the Browns. You're laying the 10. Yep. I don't care who's their quarterback. I don't care what the running back situation looks like. That team is just far and away better than this lions team. So I, I remember actually before Sunday morning, before this game, FanDuel had a uh, had like a bet special thing going on. I think they still have it too, but it, it was when will the Lions win their first game? And the best odds you were get like the the well, I should say the lowest odds was the Chicago Bears on Thanksgiving. Yep. The next lowest odds was to go zero and seventeen. <laughs> Nice. Well, that's not <laughs> so, happening. So basically what FanDuel is saying is if we don't win in Chicago in Chicago on Thanksgiving, we're not winning a game, <laughs> according to FanDuel. Which, I mean, at this point, looking at this roster and the way they played and the makeup of this team, that's not, mm-hmm. you know, that's not that crazy. They won't go 0-17. Mm-hmm. At, at worst, they can go 0-16-1 now. Which is still the second uh, lowest odds right now on there, 0-16-1. I, I believe it. I mean, Very close are, behind it, though, is Cleveland. I will say that. Plus 350 to go 0-16-1, plus 370 to beat Cleveland. decimated by injury. Yeah. And you know what I'm surprised is really high? Atlanta. It's plus 1,600 that, we, that our first win comes against the Falcons. And I feel like that's the weakest team left on our schedule, if you ask me. I would probably agree with you. I mean, Arthur Smith has done a really good job coaching that football team and resurrecting that offense. But, but this Sunday was uh, glee. Yeah, I'm, but they're a four-win football team. Yeah, they've they played well above expectation, considering mm-hmm. one of their receivers straight up quit on the season. And now They're Cordero Patterson, I believe, is is hurt for an extended period. So, uh, I mean, Atlanta's a bad football team that's got four wins. Mm-hmm. So obviously, they're a better coach team. They've got at least a little bit more talent than we have here in Detroit. So. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I oh, Russell Gage, way. as little as he's done this season, I think Russell Gage would still be far and away the best receiver in this receiving room. I mean, I'm not going to agree with that. I, I'd probably say Amon or St. Brown is a better receiver than Russell Gage, but that's that's my opinion. I'm just going off what Gage did last season. He showed more than any of our receivers have shown, personally. But It helps when you have Matt Ryan throwing you the football and not Jared Goff. Yes, let's, let's it does. start there. <laughs> like I would I wouldn't be shocked. I would not be shocked if Russell Gage, if he were to end up in a Lions uniform, if he were to have like big fat zeros week in, week out. If He's right doing that with Atlanta. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's why that's why that was my hot take was a guy who's barely doing anything for the Falcons, I think, would is so part of the receivers. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, I, is there anything else to talk about with this team? Because I'm really not looking forward to talking about them anymore. I just want you to stake your claim right now. Are they going to win this? It sure as hell looks like it, but I'm going to stand with the thought process of you can literally trip and fall into a win in the NFL mm-hmm. on a week-to-week basis, and they almost did it this week. So, somewhere I think they get one. Somewhere. I'm not going to tell you when. I'm not going to tell you how. <laughs> Not going to tell you where. Even if it takes a, a team having to forfeit because of too many players out with COVID, that's a win. They're going to find one this year. I'm telling you. I think I think if it doesn't happen on Thanksgiving, like I'm, I'm going to stake a claim and say they're going to go winless. But if they were to win a game, it's going to happen on Thanksgiving. Or I do think we would have a shot at being the Falcons. But I mean, okay, so there's three weeks I'll say I think you have a shot. Thanksgiving, four weeks. I'll give you four weeks. Thanksgiving Jeez. against the Bears. I think this weekend against the Browns is a potential, and the reason is they are so decimated with injuries. Mm-hmm. You do have a lot of guys missing from that Browns locker room, so you could find a win there. So so you would entertain the Lions plus 10? No, I would not. They would have to trip and fall into the win. 
but it is a possibility due to the fact that the Browns are so injured. Mm-hmm. Like, is Baker even back yet? Yeah, Baker's back. Okay. What did the Browns do this week? They, I'm pretty. They lost. They got destroyed forty-five to seven to the pa- yeah. by the Patriots, who are not a good football team either. They're okay. Um, I think the, I think the Patriots are playing better than I ever expected. Are you sure Baker's back? Because he only played half that game. Might have left, but he was back. Okay. Well, if Baker, they might have pulled him because they were getting blown out. I didn't watch that. That's game, possible. But. He he threw twenty-one. He was eleven and twenty-one. With a pick and a touchdown for 73 yards, Case Keenum actually was better throwing only 12 passes. He was 8, eight of 12 for 81 yards. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't have a running back right now. The running back is Deontay Johnson, who's not terrible, yeah. but he's, yeah, not he's, Nick played well. he's not he's Nick played well. He's, he's not Nick Chubb or Kareem Hunt. Well, yeah. I'm just saying in his two starts, he's played well. Yes, unless last week was a start. He had eight this, carries last week, but he only no, had 16 this, yards. This, like, this past Sunday... Was a start before right. that was not. Yeah, before that was not a start. They started someone else that week. Are you sure? I think so. I think he started like three weeks ago, and then this past week, I think someone else started in the middle there. It'd be November seventh. But still, it's a, it's a re- relevant to what we're talking about. <laughs> it is. Uh, either way, um, no, Nick Chubb started last week. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, the Browns are a team that the Lions could potentially get a win on, it, just mm. because of the fact that there is a possibility they are without their quarterback. I don't know what his status is going into this week. I know he's been hurt this year, and when he has played at times, he's not been great. He's been very up and down this year, so you never know what yeah. Baker Mayfield you're going to get. Yeah, uh, That locker room is decimated, so maybe the Lions could fall into a win there. The other one, Thanksgiving. Uh, you got two opportunities to get some wins back-to-back here. The Brown or the Bears are just a bad football team. No way of sands or butts about it. Yeah. That's and the Lions is. there's a lot of times the Lions play up on Thanksgiving. Right. Doesn't happen all the time, but there are I, your I, next one I remember is, a few different times. Your next one is as you mentioned, the uh Falcons. I think that's another one that you potentially have a shot at getting a game. Then after that, I think there is one more. Well, there's one more game I think the Lions could potentially Grab a win this year. Which is? Week 17 against the Packers. If the Packers have the division locked up and have nothing to play for, Aaron Rodgers likely does not play. So Jordan Love is your quarterback, and he really hasn't you know, done anything to impress anybody. So Yeah, that, that start wasn't that impressed. <laughs> exactly. So there you go. There's another one that the Lions could potentially take because there's a chance that they s- sit a lot of their starters. Aaron Jones probably and won't be in that game. Very good chance they had this division locked up, but they could still be playing for uh, for home field. They could. That's a possibility. But if they're not playing for anything and they already have the division locked mm-hmm. up, I don't expect to see many of the Packers starters in that game. And if that's the case, Lions got a real good shot in that one. Yeah. So there's four opportunities in my mind that they got that they have a chance to win. Yeah. Right now it's going to the Packers, Cardinals, Cowboys, and Rams are probably jostling for home field advantage. Right. Come the end of the season. Um, what's the status of uh, Kyler Murray for the Cardinals? No idea. I know he missed on Sunday, but. Uh, right. If he doesn't play, that Cardinals game becomes a lot more winnable also. I mean, I'm sure he's back by then. I would think so. I would hope so, at least. But it, it, the Cardinals running game doesn't exactly strike fear in anybody, and neither does Colt McCoy. So. But, uh, but on the hoops. Oh, thank God. <laughs> So the uh, the Pistons have been very much bipolar. Yeah, this past week. Yeah, it's been a weird one. I mean, as I was recording, the last game that was played was Monday night against Sacramento, and that was that was an ugly. They they lost that game in the first quarter. They did, and um, they were terrible. That was an ugly quarter, and really, it felt like Caden Sadiq were the only people that even realized a basketball game was going on. Yeah. Don't disagree. At LCA. <laughs> so, uh, but, they were um, the only guys in double figures for the Pistons. Yes. To give you an idea. And uh, it, in all reality, defensively speaking, the starting lineup was absolutely piss poor. Like, right. I mean, god awful defensively. No, no, I agree. I agree. That was a very bad defensive showing by that team, uh, which is kind of uncharacteristic for these Pistons. It they, is a little they, bit uncharacteristic for them. But um, 
I do want to talk about that Raptors game because I think I think that this is why I say this is a bipolar week because I feel like that Sacramento game was our worst game of the season. I feel like the Raptors. Uh, I game think the Cleveland was our game best. was. I think the Cleveland game was the worst You're game right. of the season. That that Which Cleveland was right game was. The Raptors game. Yeah, that Cleveland the, game was the, just. The bleh. Cleveland game was our worst game of the season, yes. followed by the Raptors game, which I think was our best game of the season. And then we go right back down <laughs> on a to back the to Kings. back, no less. Right. Um, <laughs> one thing about the Kings game, I will say that is a little bit nice to take out. If there's one positive I can take out of it, or right, I'm gonna give you two. One. Okay. Sadiq Bay shot. Is starting to fall. That's one. Hope, and numero uno. Stays that way. I, I agree. Two, Cade Cunningham finally gave us a glimpse of his full abilities on the floor. His oh, yeah. rebounding abilities, his passing abilities, and his scoring abilities. He put it all together for the first time this season. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's two positives to take from that game. There wasn't much else. <laughs> No, like I, I like outside those. I saw a stat earlier today. It was um, it's like after those first two games, remember those first two games where um, where Cade basically went over <laughs> two two straight from from three. Anyway, anyway, um, since then his uh, shooting splits, I think they said were uh, 45, 40, and ninety. That's and, pretty uh, damn good. I think he's averaging. They said sixteen, five, and four. Which, Which is, isn't really that far off from our uh, preseason predictions yeah, for him. Exactly. I think we said about 18, 6, and 5. But, yeah. No, we, no I, I said 15 and 6. And f- I, think, I think I said 15, 6, and 5. Or 15, 6, and 4. Maybe I said um, 17, 6, 6 assists, and 5. 6 assists, 5 or 4 rebounds. I yeah. can't remember what yours was. But one, Somewhere one, around there. One stat I want to pull, just, just to show you how bad the rest of this team was against Sacramento. Uh, so, Cade and Sadiq Bay combined. Shot uh, had fifty three points, eleven assists, fifty two percent from the field, forty five percent from three. The entire rest of the team, fifty four points, so one more point. Uh, also eleven assists, seventeen percent from the field, fifteen percent from three. That's pretty terrible for the for uh, the folks keeping score at home. That's terrible. The fact that eight that Cade got eight assists is a goddamn miracle. I bet you six of those were to Sadiq. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but Cade is somebody who's been wildly inconsistent this year, especially mm-hmm. with his shot. Uh, and looking at what we do believe to be the best game of the season for the Pistons in the Toronto Raptors game, Cade Cunningham mm-hmm. really didn't shoot that well. He had, I mean, his... He didn't have he, a great game in general. He just came in clutch towards the end. Right. He, um, he was not good in general until that final that final quarter. He shot but, two of eight from three, four of ten yeah. from the field mm-hmm. for ten points, uh, three boards, and four assists, mm-hmm. which are not really numbers you want out of your number yeah. one pick. But he, yeah, was, he was He was good huge. defensively, but that's about... He was. Uh, but but he yeah, was he was huge, huge towards the end. the fourth end. quarter, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but Dwayne Casey had a great quote about that. Um, he was saying, like... Uh, K in the locker room, like you'd expect someone who was like the first overall pick to be like crying in their milk after only scoring 10 points in a game. But uh, Cade was the happiest guy in the locker room, which he said like says a lot about it. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Who the hell says crying in their milk? It's going to be a new Caseyism. I'm telling you. (laughs) And is this is the same guy who asked recruits to make the bread? Crying, crying in their milk is a direct quote, sir. Uh, I, I understand. I'm just saying who the hell is crying in their milk. <laughs> the same guy who asks if recruits make their beds, that's who. Um, positives to look at from that game, though. Killian mm-hmm. Hayes had a game where he looked like... Last game of his career. What we, what we drafted him to be. 13 yeah. points, 10 assists, 7 boards. I mean, what more can you ask out of a guy like that? Isaiah I've Stewart, never I've never seen K- Killian so confident. He was... Dude, he had a celly after his, he he had a celly after threes he was hitting. <laughs> That's a hockey term. Look at you. <laughs> like he was doing like this like three point like bow and arrow thing. Like every time he hit one, I'm like, I've never seen him act like this. <laughs> Does a guy who shoots out from outside or shoots from so poorly from anywhere on the floor even deserve reserve the right to do a cel- a bow and arrow celebration <laughs> when he hits a shot? Normally like, I say no, but I was having way too much fun with it. But I, I hey, understand. But also, if you saw, if the fact you saw that he's shooting else better this doing year, that on another team, I'll allow it. What do you say? I said the fact that he's shooting much better this year, I'll allow it. But he's not. Yeah, he is. He, from outside, he's a little bit better, but all mm-hmm. over the floor, he's terrible. He's shooting like thirty-two percent from the field. 
I'm talking about from outside. I'm saying the fact that he's shooting a little better this year, I'll allow it. He only takes a few a game usually. So I would hope the numbers would be better. It, it, either way, it, I would be more comfortable reserving the celebrations for a time when, you know, you're not shooting 34% from the field. That's all. <laughs> Let it rain. Uh, <laughs> Isaiah Stewart active in, in on the offense side of the game. Uh, mm-hmm. Wasn't really active on the glass. Kind of weird. But yeah. 20 points for him. 24 point night for Jeremy Grant. Uh, Sadiq Bay 16, 8 and 5. I mean, that game was a total team effort for oh, the yeah. Pistons up against the Raptors. You had yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guys in double figures, and the other two guys who played put up eight and seven. Mm-hmm. Like, total team effort for the Pistons in that one. So that was definitely, like you said, that was their best game of the year. Yeah. I just I hope we see more games that are as fun to watch because – it's either that this team is extremely fun to watch, or I want to turn it off at halftime. Like, it's unfortunately with the record, there's being, no in between with this team. <laughs> unfortunately, with the record being three and ten, there's not a lot of the uh, uh, you know fun to watch excitingness. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, not so, yet. Anyways, not yet. A lot Good of people job. have been calling for uh, for Saban Lee to get back in the lineup after. That's his just because little, he shot. He made like eight stint. threes in one G League game. No, he's. He had like uh, he dropped a few forty pieces. He dropped a few. Uh, I think I think he dropped forty two or three times, and then a couple thirties in there too. Like he he just went in and dominated. But I, it's like again, like yes, that is a really not even Jill Green was doing that in the G League. Like that's a really good G League performance. However, this is a guy who's seen NBA basketball and then going back to the G League. So I naturally have higher expectations for him, and that like. I would hope he's doing that. If he was going in and just playing like the rest of the Julie players, I'd be a little more concerned. So I just want to, I just want to go out and say that like, don't just, I, yes, it's a good thing. What Sabin Lee has done in the G league, but I don't think that necessarily means he should suddenly be playing 25 minutes a game on this team. No, like it, if Sabin Lee were to actually be a guy that should be playing on this, you know, playing a, a meaningful part, a meaningful piece mm. of minutes on on this NBA roster, he would be like, I, I mm. trust Dwayne Casey enough to make to for him to make the right decisions with the lineup. Like, yes, Saban mm-hmm. Lee has looked great in his stint in the G League. No doubt about mm-hmm. it. He's he's had some great games, but it's a hell of a lot easier to do it against that type of competition. Yeah. And, and we've talked about that, how, you know, maybe some guys you know, he could be getting into some bad habits. Like, just because a guy's putting up 40 points in the G League does not mean he's going to come straight back into the NBA and be electric. He probably will struggle to make the lineup yet again because he's not doing enough right. Yes, mm-hmm. he's scoring a ton in the G League, but is he making the right decisions? Is he taking good shots? Is he making good passes? Is he playing solid defense? The answer to that may not be yes. Mm-hmm. And you can't get away with that here in the NBA like you can in the G League. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to see him back on this NBA roster, but at the same time, is he ready to play a large chunk of minutes in these games? It's yeah, that's a it's a very valid question. I think it's it's the right question to ask. I I do like that Troy called him up, gave him like ten minutes last night. Um, he didn't necessarily look bad in those ten minutes, but the way people were talking about. Saban Lee, I bet you they were expecting more of an impact in those 10 minutes. <laughs> those exactly like there's no way Saban Lee improved that much in two weeks. Like it just doesn't happen. <laughs> like, no. That, that, um, that's, that's not a thing. You don't just yeah. this ain't a like Mike situation mm. where he just yeah. has these magical superpowers because he mm. got he put on a different pair of shoes. It doesn't happen yeah. like that. Like, and I know a lot of people would rat like they want Saban Lee to basically take Kojo's minutes. But um and, and you know me, I've already, I already said going into the season, I feel like my most hated person on this team is going to be Corey Joseph because he's, he's naturally going to take minutes from Killian and Cade. Uh, but I, I really do think there's a little bit more value, even though Kojo hasn't been playing all that well offensively. I do think there's value in having that veteran presence in a lineup. Like you can't have a rotation of three guys that have collectively played less than a season of basketball at one position. Um, like there was in the uh, in the Toronto game, for example, there was a stretch in the fourth quarter where the Pistons were letting Toronto come back a bit with, and it was 
Killian and Cade running the running the uh, running the show. And Josh Jackson was at the three, and instead of taking out one of Cade or Killian, uh, Dwayne Casey actually took out Josh Jackson to put in Corey Joseph and ran with a three guard lineup because basically that the presence of Corey Joseph on the court kind of steadied Cade and Killian and helped them like refocus. And I, so like that's that's the kind of value that a guy like Corey Joseph. Corey Joseph is going to bring to you. So I don't think he would have been able to do that if you're subbing in Saban Lee instead of Corey Joseph. That's basically what I'm getting at. Corey Joseph brings a level of veteran leadership that pretty much mm-hmm. nobody else besides Jeremy Grant has on this floor. And mm-hmm. frankly, he's the only guard that has any kind of that veteran suave to him, like that veteran savvy to him that can help other players in the backcourt out there. And yeah, so, frankly, having a guy like Corey Joseph in your lineup is actually a benefit, even though it is frustrating to us fans as he takes away minutes from guys like Cade, Killian, Saban Lee, you know, et cetera. Yes, it is frustrating, but at the same time, he could potentially be crucial to the development of some of these young guys. Mm-hmm. So having him in the lineup is not necessarily a bad thing. And I, I do want to talk about one little bit of drama, our first bit of drama I think that we've had in the Troy Weaver era. And that was, I believe it, it was during the... You mean Trey Lyle saying he doesn't even want to come to Detroit doesn't count? No. <laughs> um, I believe it was during the Cavs game, I want to say, if I remember correctly. But uh, we we know that Diallo's kind of been at the back of the bench this season. Like, he hasn't seen a lot of playing time at all. Actually, mostly DNPs, but um, DNP CDs. But in garbage time against the Cavs, when we were down big and was looking ugly. Dwayne Casey uh, told Diallo to get in the game. And like so Diallo like kind of like lazily gets off the bench and it looks like he mutters something as he's walking by Dwayne Casey. And then uh, Dwayne tells him to go sit back down. Like he's not putting him in the game. And then uh, so like, there was like a bit of like an altercation in the bench. And then Troy, Troy Weaver was at the game. Troy Weaver physically came down from his seat and took uh, Hamadou Diallo to the locker room. A lot of people took that as, oh, it's over for Diallo. Like he's getting traded in height kind of thing. Dwayne actually ended up putting him in in the Sacramento game yesterday. And for the first time in a while, and it was only for like 10 minutes, but Diallo was actually fairly productive in those 10 minutes. So like, I'm so the reason I'm bringing this up is because a lot of people are saying that the reason, because a lot of people are saying that Marvin Bagley played his first minutes in a while against the Pistons in that game, and Diallo played his first minutes in a while against the king against the kings like they they it looked like they were kind of showcasing him um but if if Diallo is as productive as he was in those minutes I'd rather keep Diallo than than try to move him for someone like Bagley and but again it's it it goes back to I don't I don't think the reason Diallo's not cracking the rotation is anything that he's doing I really do feel like Kate Cunningham, the difference between last year and this year is Kate Cunningham. He takes a lot of those guard minutes now. And Killian Hayes is earning a lot more minutes. So, like, it's it's kind of hard to find time in that guard rotation for someone like Diallo. I think it's a mixture of both, frankly, with Diallo. I, I do think his attitude's been an issue with, with Dwayne Casey, and he hasn't really picked up things the way he that he would like Diallo to. Mm-hmm. And Diallo's not responded well to criticism, and that's obvious. But I also think that you are right. It, it Killian Hayes is also a guy fighting for minutes. Cade Cunningham is taking minutes away from him, especially in those combo guard situations. Josh Jackson's been very effective offensively, so he's taking minutes away from him. Uh, Frank Jackson's starting to turn his shot around, so he's taking minutes away from him. Like there's, there's a <laughs> lot of guards on this roster. Let's be honest. I would have rather seen the all over Jackson for so far most of the games this season, but... Yes, it, Frank Jackson looks like he's slowly starting to turn a corner, and yes. if he is, I'd rather have that shooting. So, I and I agree with you. Granted, Diallo can shoot; he mm-hmm. he can, uh, but he is a little bit more explosive than anything. Mm-hmm. But I mean, and, and I'll, I'll say this: I do think you undervalue Marvin Bagley quite a bit. I think Marvin Bagley, for most of his career, has been more effective than Amadou Diallo has in his short career. Um, he's gotten more opportunity, that's for sure. And seasons past, he's just not getting opportunity this year. And I think that's a little bit of a mutual decision between the two parties there. <clears throat> but 
I do like the upside that Hamadou Diallo brings. Mm-hmm. But then again, is there a fit for him on this roster? And we had this conversation in the offseason with the amount of guards and wings that we have on this roster. Mm-hmm. One of them is going to be the odd man out. And we're starting to see that as Hamadou Diallo. And that is something we are worried about. Uh, well, you, you very much, I think, if you want to add some of this roster, you very much need to add a big. I mean, yes. And that's where Marvin. Bagley most of our bench is our is is um guards especially now with kelly olenic being out that that's yeah. another big reason why a big would make more sense but my only thing is marvin bagley is the exact opposite type of big than what i want to add like he's a guy that isn't he's a really effective presence guy not really because his offensively yes but you can't plop him down there because he's a zero defensively in the post so like he'll that's get true, but also so is luca garza and kelly olenic so what do you get yeah there? and i don't want and i don't really like luca garza getting minutes <laughs> bagley can at least block some shots there is that um, he he can at least block some shots he's got the athleticism, athleticism yeah. to do that but i mean the question's going to become do we have room on this roster for Hamadou Diallo? I want to say yes. I want to keep mm-hmm. Diallo. I think the upside is absolutely there. I think he can really be a very mm-hmm. talented player on this roster. But the way things are going right now and the way this roster is shaping up and trending, the answer right now is no. Yeah, and, I'll be honest, I, I think it's inevitable that he's probably gone by the trade deadline. Like I don't... I don't see disagree. Why he would still be here past that? I don't disagree at all. And and, and I like the guy. I so. do. I want to see him be successful in a Pistons uniform. But looking at the roster and the way it's shaped up, mm-hmm. there's just not a, there's just not room for him on this in this lineup. And and mm-hmm. it's a waste of a roster spot to have him just sitting there, you know, third, fourth, fifth in the pecking mm-hmm. order at that at at a guard position. So got to find something to do with them and frankly trade may be the best option cuz at least you can fill a hole on this roster going after a guy who can yeah. play some minutes at at a 4 or a 5 position. Yeah. I agree. And I I think that's definitely our biggest need right now is we need a big body down there. We do. Um, and and it's even more glaring with Kelly Olynyk mm-hmm. not being in the lineup because he's hurt. I mean, not only was Garza getting dunked on by the opposing team all the time, but he got dunked on by Cade. Cade dunked on him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man but yeah I, that's the other thing i i love especially against the kings the aggressiveness that garza brings i mean he was really fighting down there for the boards and he's offensively so like he's defensively though but yeah it's he's so and this is this is what i was saying when we drafted him why i was worried about it i'm like this there's a reason he went in the second round like it, it's as for as good of an offensive player he is, he's a worse defensive player. Mm-hmm. Does it at all worry you that he straight up got a DNP CD in the game against the Raptors? Like this team has no big body behind Isaiah Stewart right now. And he got a DNP CD. He is the only guy. Yeah. Like your the biggest bench player you played was Trey Lyles. You no, know, I, I don't disagree that it's, it goes and it, it goes to show just it's really I think what it really is is his minutes are entirely reliant on if these two can stay out of foul trouble foul trouble or not. Like if I think they would a hundred times out of a hundred rather play B Stu like forty minutes in a game. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and he played thirty three in that game. Because it. um, it's not like Trey Lyles is some really good defender either, no. but and he's not exactly a big body. He's 6'9", 234. Like, yeah. yeah, he's got a little bit of length there, but that's not big enough to cover the the mm-hmm. bigger players in this league. Yeah. Yeah, but it's something we've been saying for weeks. It's a glaring hole in this team that only got worse when Kyle and it got hurt. So, But in general, we need some scoring off that bench without Olenek. Uh, and and I think you're going to start to see it coming around a little bit as Frank Jackson's shot starts to fall, yep. as you start to see uh, Josh Jackson continue to be effective offensively. I, I yep. do think you are going to see a trend in the right direction for the scoring. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe Hamidou Diallo gets some run after some effective minutes in, in that Kings game. So who knows? Yes. But we'll find out. I, I, I hope to see some increased scoring off the bench for sure. Oh, yeah. But it's been rough going so far. Mm-hmm. One more stat I want to give you on K, by the way. Mm-hmm. Apparently, youngest player in NBA history to go 20, 25, 8, and 8 while hitting five threes. It's a very specific stat. I was going to say, I, I hate <laughs> stats like that. Like, I hate. 
Loathe <laughs> stats like that. Oh, he's the first guy to put up 32 <laughs> points on a Wednesday night when it rained <laughs> outside, but also snowed in the morning. Like, I hate stats like that. <sighs> but um, he's also the, uh, I think they say he's the first Pistons rookie to do that since Grant Hill. Which, I mean, the heat, nice. the comparisons for Grant Hill. Yeah, he, he, so that's nice. Or those are the comparisons for Cade. Was Grant Hill, Grant Hill, Magic Johnson? Not saying he is Magic, but mm-hmm. or Grant Hill even. But mm-hmm. in terms of the player type, that's who he is. Yeah, and I like it. I like it a oh, lot. Well, the, I, he's getting better every game, and I, I love seeing it. That is another thing that I've really noticed with his game is he he just seems to be more comfortable in in his in his shoes and more comfortable out there on the floor where he's willing to take control and kind of take over mm-hmm. like he did at the end of the Raptors game. He's comfortable being the guy to get the basketball in big time yeah. minutes and in crucial minutes and and that's mm-hmm. exactly what he's he's done. So one one thing that uh that I find very peculiar about his game is and this is something I was I kind of had questions about going in and he's kind of proved me wrong was he has shown that he has the ability to basically get to the rack whenever he wants. If he just doesn't do it often, and it it, it bugs me a little bit. I'm like, like I'll 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 see like he'll have three straight like he'll be like asleep the whole game. I don't want to say asleep, but like he'll be pretty quiet offensively the whole game, and then like early in the fourth quarter, suddenly he just keeps attacking the basket and getting to the rim. And I'm like, we're if you if you were able to do this to your man the entire time, why weren't we doing this earlier? <laughs> No, I, I kind of completely agree with you. Like he's he's a guy that, and this is how exactly how I feel about um, Jeremy Grant as well. Like he they have the ability to be aggressive and and get to the rim and make their own shot and and get to the hole. And they just choose not to. Like they have yeah. the skill, they have the talent, they have you know what it takes, and they're even giving themselves the opportunity. They're just choosing not to take it, and yeah. it's annoying. But it does make me at least a little bit happy that they have the ability to just do it whenever they want, and they're picking exactly. and choosing their spots. But yeah. I'd rather them choose, you know, because these guys are supposed to be the alphas on this team. I, I'd rather see them be more aggressive when the opportunity is given to them. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. But like, yeah, with a guy like with a guy the size of Cade, and with the ability of Cade, like I feel like he hasn't since we last recorded. He's played four games. He hasn't taken a single free throw in those four games. Like, he should be able to get to the line. That's what I kind of want to see more of. Absolutely. 100% agree. But, yeah, that's that's all I have. On it. Hopefully it's a better better Pistons week this week. Hopefully we don't have a, any of those dud games like we had last week. I fully expect to see plenty more dud games again. Like we said, that this team <laughs> isn't, you know, we going into the season thought that this team was going to be a little bit better than they are. And we've kind of tempered those expectations a little bit. So I do expect to see some bad games, but I also expect to see some good games like we saw against the Raptors. You know, I'd like to see a game where Cade and Sadiq are clearly the best players on the floor for the Pistons, but they also win one of those games. You know, we saw that in the Kings game, but the rest of the team was so terrible and even defensively speaking, those two guys are pretty terrible also. But I want to see those guys have good all around games, but also the team does as well. Like I you know, I want to see things kind of come together. We haven't really gotten to see things fully come together with yeah. those two young guys being the alphas on the floor for us. So hopefully mm-hmm. we get to see that soon. Yep. So anything else? That's all I got. All right, that is gonna close it out for this week, guys. Thank you for listening. We'll catch you next week. For uh, a recap on the Lions weekend and lead you into Thanksgiving. So as we're getting close to the holidays. So mm-hmm. hope you guys enjoy your week and enjoy your weekends. Uh, Andrew, thank you for joining me. Follow us on Twitter at Real Fan Report. Thank you to Detroit Sports Podcast as always. This has been the Fan Report. was by fans. For fans. We'll catch you guys next week. Have a good one. Peace out. Peace.